that I put the remote on the chalkboard out there while doing the packers. Uh, where did it go? Good to see everybody here this morning. We've got some exciting news, some new members placing membership with us. We'll save that for the end. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we thank you that you've come our way. If you would, please let yourself be known by filling out one of those cards that are in the pew in front of you. Slip it to one of us, myself, or a man that you find in the foyer or even in the contribution box that's in the back. We'd love to have record of your attendance. If you're joining us online, thank you for doing so. We welcome you to come and worship with us at any time. It is Thanksgiving week. I don't know if you have any plans to travel, but safe travels if you're going to or fro from family, and I hope that your time is a blessing with the family. We're going to look at, to begin with, Proverbs chapter nine, or 16. Proverbs chapter 16 is our scripture reading. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, and this is from the New American Standard Bible. The plans of the heart belong to a person, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, but the Lord examines the motives. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Be merciful and truth. Be, by mercy, excuse me, and truth, atonement is made for wrongdoing. And by fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. When a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he causes even his enemies to make peace with him. Better is a little righteousness than great income with Injustice. The mind of a person plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Again, verse 4 of what we just read, just an emphasis upon the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Why this day? Admittedly, that's probably a question that doesn't come to your mind often. Why this day? But I want you to imagine today as you woke up, you turned to the Lord and you said, why have you given me this day? Now, if you ask that question of the Lord or you had that particular frame of mind, I hope that it wasn't because you were going through some sort of a crisis or some sort of a travail that is happening to you. Although we can all think of those times, maybe even if you're in school right now and midterms are coming up or term papers or possibly at work there's a project and you can think why this day in the sense of lord just help me get through this day but that's not what i want us to look at today but for what reason if every day is a gift from god and it is and we're going to look at that passage here in just a moment from psalm 118 if every day is a gift from god then why has he given us today and you say well Perhaps it's so that I can accomplish something. And that wouldn't be an improper way to start your day, would it? Lord, please help me to see the things that I can serve you better. Help me to know what work that I ought to do. Not necessarily the work that we do in order to provide for our family, although that's work for the Lord as well. But in his vineyard, Lord, what would you want me to accomplish today in that sense? Why this day? And you might say, well, if I do that at the beginning of the day and then I do it again at the end of the day and then all I have done is my routine and I, I, there hasn't been anything special as far as a conversation with anybody. I, I can't identify anything. There's not a connection that was made. I really don't see within my day's activities, those 8 to 12 hours, that signifies that I have done something that was a beacon for the Lord and for his church, and you might then, at the end of the day, if you went through that, be a little bit discouraged and say, well, did I miss it? And not that we don't miss it, okay? We, we do so often miss the things that God would desire for us to accomplish. But would you have accomplished? Would I be setting you up for disappointment? Would there be something that you can identify? Well, as we go through the course of the lesson this morning, I don't want you to lose sight of those special opportunities that God places within our day in order that we might accomplish his will, but I want you to even see the mundane, 
those routine quote-unquote things, maybe even the exams and the term papers and the projects up at work as an opportunity for us to glorify God and to serve him. Why this day? Why has he granted me this day? Well, that passage in Psalm 118 that I mentioned in verse 24 says, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Are you singing it within your mind? Some of you, that's good, right? Because that's the way that David wrote it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to look at David in just a moment or two and see in which way that he start his day. At least we'll try by the example that we have from him and the things that he did. But here David says that his viewpoint is one where he sees each day as a gift from God. This day is a gift from my creator. This is something that I have been blessed with by God. If each day is a gift, then what have you given to him lately? You know, usually we talk about exchanging gifts, not so much on birthdays because it's just the birthday person that's getting the gift, but on other holidays. I don't know if you come from a family that's large enough. In my family, if we bought a gift for everybody within the family, then you'd be in the poorhouse. Not that we weren't in the poorhouse anyways, but we would draw names, right? And so that you would identify a brother or a sister in which you were to buy a gift for. And then you were supposed to try to keep it secret. Uh, Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. But we we always seem to get a gift for mom and dad. Did you guys do this? Did you have a large enough family where you have to draw names? And so you exchange gifts. Well, if each day is a gift from God, then what have you given him lately? Quite often we think of our days in the term of days of the week. What do you view Sunday as being? Did you wake up this morning and say, Why this day? You say, well, I know why I have this day. I have this day as an opportunity to worship God. God has especially set this day aside for us to come together as a church, as Jesus instituted within that Last Supper, to partake of his body, the bread, to to take of the fruit of the vine, his blood, and to do so on the first day, day of the week. Why this day? That's not so difficult on Sundays to figure out, right? But what about Mondays? Oh, do you like Mondays? Blue Mondays? Just another manic Mondays, as it's said, right? If every day was a gift, you might want to see where you can return Mondays sometimes, right? And in fact, if you were to ask the world, what is the most special day of the week? It would be anything besides the first day, generally speaking, that you go back to work, right? In fact, we have that initialism uh, that Fridays are the best day. That's the day that we live for, right? That's that we live for the weekends. Those are blessing from God. All those other days, oh, those are a burden. Do you see your days of the week like that? Do you have special days within the week? Do you think that the psalmist felt that way? Do you think that that was David's attitude? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You ever met somebody that could smile every single day of the week, every hour of the day? And you just wonder, how are they always so joyful? I have a Mama Sykes that is like that. She's just been a great influence upon our family. I ran into one yesterday at the funeral for Joe Dillard, which I thought was a wonderful service for a man and honoring him in the life of, of service unto the Lord. But I ran into Mary Jo Foster. Now, many of you I see in this same way, but to save you embarrassment of bringing up your name in front of the whole congregation, I thought of her to use her, and so I am. (laughs) She, if you ever met Mary Jo Foster, she's from East Point Congregation. She is always smiling. She is always joyful, and she's working with children nonstop. She's had Mary's Little Lambs usually about 12 to 15 kids that would be over at her house for years. As she even right now, nearing retirement, has five kids. Three of them are two years old in her house on a daily basis. She teaches class, and she is able to sit down with kids, and whenever they're misbehaving or they're doing something that they ought not, to get them 
their frame of mind into worshiping God. It, it's amazing the way that she can do this, and she is just a great encourager. And in fact, I went over to her yesterday, and I said, Mary Jo, I thought about bringing your name up in a lesson. Is that okay with you? And she says, oh, yes, I think everybody should just be so full of joy. And then last night, as I was uh, preparing for my lesson, I received more encouragement <laughs> from Mary Jo. And she just went on and on, mostly Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, on down through that she wrote to me. And then she forgot verse 9, and so she went back up to verse 9, and she quoted verse, <laughs> verse 9 again. And then she said, this is the day, Jed, that the Lord has made. And she is such a wonderful encourager. And in fact, this morning, after she had sent all of this to me last night, this truly is the day that the Lord has made. Continue to rejoice and be glad in it. She sent me that this morning. Just as a reminder, but you know people like this, don't you? You've, you've had experiences with individual like, like that. I visualize David as being that way, that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Does it hurt to put a smile on your face? Now, I've been told all my life that it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Do you believe that? I didn't think so either. You know, that's why the photographer says, now smile, because he knows which one's easiest for us to do. I will rejoice. I will be glad. David had this concept that whenever the sun rose, that God's power and protection was evident. If he could breathe in, if he could roll off the bed or the pallet or the, the straw or whatever it was that he slept on at night, get up and go about his day, then this is a day that is a blessing from God. God, how many days do you have to be laid up in bed before you appreciate your health and your mobility? Could be just an illness that you got, laid you up in bed for a few days. Maybe you broke a bone. Maybe it was a surgery that you're having to recover from. Something seriously wrong with your body. How many days do you have to be laid up in bed before you finally get out of bed and go about your normal activities and you just feel good? Why does it take those types of situations? for us to truly appreciate the gifts of God. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul says, God is not only our creator, but he is interacting with us on a daily basis. Now, admittedly, this is speaking about the nations in general, but nations are made up of individuals. And he says in verse 26 of Acts chapter 17, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God at work with mankind from the very beginning through the time of Acts and the apostles continuing on today. You are alive for a reason. God has influence upon your life. If God didn't have influence upon your life, if God didn't have influence upon even the nations, then why would he have the Apostle Paul write unto Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1? First of all, then I urge that requests and prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people for kings and for all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and uh, of God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Why would God have me pray for something that he had no hand in? Why would God declare, I want my children praying on the behalf of all men, especially those who are in authority? Why would God say, I want my children doing something that he had no influence upon or effect upon or power? But he does. He does. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then that passage that we began with in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 4, the Lord has made everything for a purpose. Why this day? Why am I breathing? Why are you alive? It's for a reason. And you say, but I can't see it. I don't know what it is. I'm doing my best to map out my life and everything keeps going wrong. I'm stumbling around. I, I, I fall, I, I feel like I am tossed to and fro. I, I am so confused. If this is the day that the Lord has made, I wish he would have told me why. I can't figure it out. I imagine him sitting on the side of the hill, not too far from the flock, having just counted them and made sure that every one of them was there, 
leading them to green pastures, not simply beside running water because sheep don't like to drink from running water and actually making a pool there for the sheep to come up and to drink from. Just a boy about his father Jesse's business and singing at the top of his lungs while he's out there because that was the nature of David. Hey, David, why did God give you this day? I see him a little bit more grown now, not fully grown, still a boy, and he has a carry-on sack going to meet his brothers on a mission to the Israeli uh, camp. Not that he is a uh, warrior himself, but going to go and meet his brothers. Hey, David, why did God give you this day? I see him fleeing the wrath of a king that he honored that he had faith in with a band of men huddled up in the dark and in the caves. Hey, David, why did God give you this day? Then I see him sitting upon the throne, and maybe if there was one where I can hear David having a response to, it would be this one, sitting upon the throne as the king over all Israel. But I see that same king humbled before the prophet Nathan and his sins being exposed and declared to him. David, why this day? As a shepherd boy, God gave him that day for a reason, didn't he? To compose songs. Many of the songs that we have are still recorded for us today. If he hadn't have grown up to be a shepherd boy that killed a lion and a bear, could he have grown to be the leader of God's people? like God desired for him to be? If he hadn't listened to his father and gone about that mission to the Israeli army with that care package on his back, or however it was that he was carrying it, to his brothers, would he have ever faced Goliath? If he hadn't have learned respect, even a king that dishonored God, would he have, not, would he have ever learned how to be humble? If the prophet would have never come to him and said those words that cut him to his heart, he would have never had a day of repentance. Why this day? Do you see what we have done? We try to go briskly through the life of David, of a man that is called in the Old and in the New Testament, a man after God's own heart. And no matter what he was doing, he knew that the Lord was watching over him and that he was protecting him and that he was shaping him into the king and the leader that he needed him to be. Could David have known whenever he was out there watching the sheep what God had in store for him? Could David have known whenever he killed the lion and the bear that these were stepping stones that God was bringing him to? I'm sure, though, David, each morning, whenever he got up, he said, this is the day that the Lord has given me. And he set out to accomplish what he thought was the Lord's desire. And within his life, he said, this is enough. This is all I need. I've got a relationship with Jehovah. It, I don't need to know everything that Jehovah knows. I simply continue to walk with him until that period of time for at least nine months whenever he walked away from the Lord and he had to be called by Nathan back home and he did it. He said, I have sinned and he was back. And as that child was about to die that laid on its deathbed and he mourned, that child that Nathan said is going to die because of your sin, David. Did David blame God? Did David shout to the heavens at God, God, why have you given me this day? Lord, why would you take him from me? No, what does it say? It says that he got up, that he washed himself, that he shaved, and his demeanor was so different after the child had died that the servants were, said, this doesn't make sense. Whenever the child was still living, you mourn, but now that he is dead, you have gotten up and gone. And David, what did he learn from all of that? He said, he cannot return to me, but I can go to him. And an epiphany happens even on that day that this can draw me closer to God. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I Be
started with in Proverbs chapter 16 and you notice that the proverb writer was revealing that man makes many plans the plans of man are within the mind of man but it is who that directs his steps it is the Lord as it concluded that directs the steps this is the day that the Lord has made why this day because every day is an opportunity to worship because every day is an opportunity to praise. Because every opportunity that we have each day is to sing his praises and to live in a way that brings God glory and honor. He was a shepherd boy. He was a son that was on an errand. He was a soldier that was on the run. He was an adulteress and murderer, convicted, the king of Israel, the shepherd of God's people. You see, God was shaping David because he knew exactly what David needed in each and every day. But you say, that's not fair. You know, David had a glimpse into what God desired of him. I don't know. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. We just sung it, right? May my steps be worshipped. May my thoughts be praised. May my words bring honor to your name. Religion is relationship. My relationship with God is paramount uh, to honor him and to glorify him, to be thankful for everything that he has given to me within my life, not just one day out of the year, right? Gratefulness is a sign that my heart is in the right place. Ungratefulness is the first sign of a fallen heart. Do you know that? Ungratefulness is the first sign of a fallen heart. Gratefulness to God for all that he has given me, but then an expectation that he desires me to be within his service. This song we're not going to sing. I don't know if we know it, but let me just read the lyrics to you. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You've given life to me. Heartache, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died at Calvary. Your touch is what I long for. You have given life to me. You wake up with that frame of mind within the morning, and it's not, why, Lord, why have you given me this day? But it is, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. If I understand that my relationship with God is so important to him that he was willing to give himself, that he was willing to allow his son to die on my behalf. If I understand that, I may not know why he or what exactly he is accomplishing within my day, but I know that he loves me and that he is there and that he is with me. And if I will but walk in the way in which he desires for me to walk, then I have a blessed piece of eternal life, no matter how long or short my life be. But the second part of that, of religion, is relationship, is my relationship with my fellow man. If each day is a gift, what have you given to him lately? David was called a man after God's own heart, not because he was sinless, we have already seen that, but because he was a man that sought after God's own heart. I mean, David, he just desired to be close to God. In that time in his life, whenever his passions got blurred and he walked away from the Lord, he was reminded of it and he immediately turned around and repented and he was back with the Lord again. Do you long for heaven? You know, the apostle Paul was given a glimpse, kind of like Peter, that his time was almost up. And he says this to the Philippian uh, brethren in Philippians chapter 1. For me... For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which, is, which to choose. But I am hard-pressed between both directions. You wouldn't think that that would be the case, but it was for Paul, right? Having the desire to depart to be with Christ, and that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all of your progress and joy in the faith, so that your pride in Christ Jesus may be abundant because of me by my coming to you again. Paul understood that each day was a blessing from the Lord, and he was going to use that opportunity as God gave him life in order to fulfill those things. And it was that second part of religion is relationship. Yes, love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. We come together to celebrate God, his son's body, his blood, to look at the death, burial, and the resurrection so that we have that opportunity here on the first day of the week to give him glory and give him honor. But it is so that we can learn how to become better servants so that how we can serve one another and how we can serve those are, that are around us. So why this day? To glorify him, to honor God, and to speak words of encouragement, of enlightenment to one another and to those that are still groping around in darkness and in sin. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If he has not yet become that joy to you, if you have not yet put him on in baptism, he bids you to come as we stand and as we sing.